Well, I went to um, our biggest bus and we're so excited to have such a big turnout today. This is so great. So, most of you know that Wi Fi is a part of 210. So, can you raise your hand if you've been to another, if you've been to a Wi Fi or 210 event? A lot of people. Awesome. Okay. So, for those of you that may not have, um, I just want to tell you a little bit about 210 and what we do. I'm um, sorry, a nonprofit organization that's just for the fitness industry. So we provide financial assistance and scholarships for those in the industry. So an example might be um, if somebody needs um, help paying their mortgage and their spouse is having a hard time because they're having a health crisis, and we would send the check for that right to the company and take care of that for them. So, um, you have all tickets for this event, so that means that you supported two times, so thank you so much for doing that. And um, so just to say a little bit, you're here, and Kathy is our one of the biggest today, so she's going to talk to you a little bit about Wi-Fi specifically. Perfect. So, did you know Wi-Fi grew from the need for women in our industry to support one another? We met in small groups starting in 2008, and how Wi-Fi in our Wi-Fi is in eight cities. Almost 900 women in our industry participate in events and programs like the one you're at this evening. Wi-Fi also runs a mentoring program, and applications go out in January. So if you're interested or want to get more involved, please feel free to reach out to Tanya or myself. So tonight, I encourage you to meet new people, learn something you didn't know, and check out up-and-coming Wi-Fi events at 210.org. We'll go ahead and get started by bringing up our first panelist, Jocelyn Cunning. Yeah. <laughs> she is the CEO of the Kung Group. In her 20 years at the helm of the Kung Group, Jocelyn has empowered many top business leaders, enabling them to motivate their workplaces to new pinnacles of business and personal success. The Kung Group's systematic methodology maximizes human effectiveness and eradicates performance roadblocks. Executives and teams that range from Fortune 500 companies to startups have benefited from her work. Next, we have Holly Delaney. <laughs> Holly is the director of People Experiences for Zappos.com. Holly has over eight years with the Zappos family and many more in the world of human resources. Holly has been pivotal in working to deliver happiness and provide the best place for employees to work. Our third panelist member is Julian Justin. <laughs> Julian brings over 25 years of experience in senior leadership, positions in human resources, and organizational development. Her industry experience includes Fortune 500 healthcare, global professional services, technology, and entertainment. Julie received her master's degree in industrial and organizational psychology from Texas A&M University, and she is currently executive vice president of human resources within Evanstar. Our last panelist, but not least, is Diane Woods. <laughs> Diane Woods currently serves as the Vice President and General Manager of North America at Timberland. During the past 16 years, she has helped to grow and lead the casual and industrial businesses for Timberland in a variety of roles. She is passionate about people, culture, and creating a brand with impact, and is, creating a, and is proud to be a part of a company whose mission is to equip people to make a difference in their world. Diane earned a bachelor's degree in business from the Wallace E. Carroll Graduate School of Management at Boston College, and she currently resides in Cape Elizabeth, Maine, with her husband and four children. Thank you so much, you guys, for attending today. So, let's get this thing started. We want to hear your questions, so feel free to roll them in at any time during this panel discussion. I'm going to go ahead and kick it to get you guys on the and then we'll kind of gauge the interest as to what's burning and what's at top of mind. Um, so let's start with what does leadership mean to you? Who wants to start? Anyone want to talk about that question? Okay, how about that? I don't think I could do it directly. 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 I
decisions to bring their ideas and bring themselves into their work because that's what makes a company special. So if you have an inspirational leader that really makes you want to be there every day, I think that's what helps. Great. Thanks, Holly. Does anyone else want to answer or respond? Oh, I'll, I'll follow up. I, I couldn't agree more. I think in, you know, in my own experience, you know, you hear a lot about motivation or you hear a lot about, um, you know, telling someone, you know, this is the direction you need to go. And I think, you know, what is such an essential part of leadership is inspiration. It's, you know, it's helping others kind of find their path, find what they're good at and applying that, you know, and, and applying that and, and delivering that in a way that really helps the organization move forward. Think of yourselves as um, kind of helping people find their way and what they're good at. Wait, Jocelyn, did you have something to yeah, add? Yeah, just to add to those great points, um, my sense is that <clears throat> making the transition from being really good at what you do, which you all are really good at something that you're whether you're a designer or you know an HR professional, you go into leadership, and I think your job then becomes about meaning making. If that makes any sense, you know you've got to make it a reason. You've got to stand for a reason for people to want to do something. And oftentimes you're asking them to do something that they're not really interested in doing, or that it's hard. There's change. You know you're trying to do get your job done today while you're thinking about tomorrow's innovations. So being able to actually communicate that in a way that touches people's hearts is is what I think leadership is about, you know, and it's all this, I think inspiration is definitely how that shows up. You create more energy than you consume when you're a good leader. You can feel it, right? You can feel that energy in the room when you have someone there that, that gets you. Necessarily always concerned with the hard Because the language is business, it's just simply more 
take my cue from my opponent, right? He's got technically you can tell a great story and it's a quiz. I haven't used that yet. But there was that quiz, you know, I'm proud of the fun story to do the story because I get the. <laughs> At the same time, again, you know, I have also been able to be a little positive in this book. I think the essence is, is, is recognize what the behaviors of business are, the language of business are, and it is. And, and I think it's becoming um, more valuable now as, as compared to many of the ways and many of that way. Um, I have some of the great great ideas that there's a woman at Stanford up in California that teaches women about power. Named Deborah Green Springfield, she's a professor at Stanford Business School. I learned something watching her the other day when she talked about the difference between playing high and playing low. And it's all about the body language, you know, just to focus on communication. And that women, we tend to do a lot of playing low, which is nodding. Good eye contact, you know, creating a warm and pathetic environment for interaction. I know I do that. And that's good, but you don't want to overdo that. So being able to know when it's time to do the opposite, which is playing high. And that means sometimes not, you know, leaning out and not necessarily like sitting at the head of the table and, you know, not keeping everybody great eye contact. So being able to just assume an authoritative position. When it's the right time for you to do that, it's just something to pay attention to because most of the communication is by one which is kind of voice. It's not actually the words that you say. Seven percent is based on what you say. The rest of it is by language and tone of voice. So kind of like look at yourself. You know, how are you standing? How are you speaking? Where you sit at the table? I found that you sit. Your job as a doctor is to do your job as a doctor. And when I got that, I thought, that's true. 
maybe I wouldn't be the best hero and the executive that I can have done. So, again, I'm the best to look for that graphics because I know what that person is and I know what their stuff is. So, it was really good at that for me to take that. It's not about comparing yourself to other people out there. It is looking at the person and situation that I'm in and finding the things that I'm doing right now and what I'm looking at what I'm doing right and believing in that and believing in myself because I'm in this position for a reason. And it's something that I have that the people around me have seen. And that's why I'm there. And so I think when I'm taking a step back and not worrying about doing everything else, but worrying about what you're doing, what you're doing. I don't think I'm going to talk about the most of them, but I'm going to add a non work example of that. So I have a lot of stories and I have a lot of stories. And, uh, and, you know, for years, I went the whole, like, you know, you go to school and you're not worthy because all the moms are looking at you like, oh, you're not like, oh, you know, what you're doing? And then after years of beating myself up about that, and I'm not coming up with this and enough of that, because the mom thing is really, um, I realized my kids are awesome. I'm not great, but, you know, like, I just have this opportunity with myself. Uh, mm-hmm. I'm doing this exactly how I think it's going to happen. And my kids are great, and they're not, you know, hopefully headed for 20 years of therapy. And, you know, it's a good way to talk about it. But once I do that, I can't keep thinking about what he thinks about how I work or what this one thinks about this. Uh, I'm actually totally fine. So it's also very fun about the book. I mean, if you think you're doing it the way you should be doing it, it's really easy. I want to ask you all this question because I think, and I don't know if I want to make a stereotype about us all being women, but this concern about pleasing. Yeah. You know, pleasing is a really, it can help in so many ways and it can hurt in so many ways. And if you have that sort of pleasing mm-hmm. syndrome of wanting everybody to be okay and taking care of everyone and making sure that that person for me was not so that really brief, it's, you know, it's just gross. You, you can't make everybody happy. Mm-hmm. And, and I love what you said about just feeling like you're not you're not worthy as a mom, you're not worthy as whatever your role is in your organization. And that's the first place to be able to talk to you and to accept that you are worthy. Mm-hmm. 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 Mm-hmm
And it's been like dying, working in a cubicle and wanting to be on my own. Mm-hmm. You know, that you just get so close to the wall that you're not happy doing whatever it is that's there for you in the moment. But you have to create something that isn't what it's not a reality yet. So and I think for you, it's been struggle. You know, that through struggle, a lot of business has come out of it. To be able to just walk right into it instead of walking around it. It's hard, but that, 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 that something comes out of that. I think it's, um, you know, for me, if I go back and think about different opportunities that have been presented or options, I, I think the question I kind of had the conversation with myself was, well, it's okay, I can't figure out how to do this, but I can't figure out how to do this. And, and that was the spectrum of things in my career from how about the data that the internet has, you know, carried cards that you punched one point for the two laptop days and put them up in two. I can tell you, I figured it out, you know, there are very much like calling and dropping your thing. And sometimes it's the thing that I'm going to do. It's okay, just figure it out. And it kind of becomes this really cool and exciting adventure. You can do the research. And I think the other thing is ask for help. I mean, if there's anything I've learned, it is, you know, don't, don't feel like you have all the answers. Don't let your ego get in the way. Ask for help because people love to help you. And what if you feel like they have something else? I want to add one that may be contrary, but I think if you go into any job, and say, I'm here because I want to get to the next level, is the best way to not get to the next level. Mm-hmm. And that would be because everyone can sniff that out in about two seconds. Um, you are in a job, and it's what everyone has said, and you fully invest in that job, and you just want to do that to the best of your ability. Guess what? Then all of a sudden, options come your way, and people want to talk to you about other things, and you can because you gained this knowledge base or because you accomplished these things, but you did them because you were fully invested in that job, not saying, I mean, I'm actually no kidding how a person said to me today, well, I'm not going to be here in this job. You have a job, I'm not going to be in this job one. Those relationships. You have to know that all the time because it changes. Right, Nikki? 
Washington is one of the best uh, home towns out there. And it, when you spend a lot of, you know, uh, work and reading and whatever, and then you listen to that, it kind of crystallizes a lot of things. You know, but, uh, yeah. Um, I have to listen to it. Yeah. So, 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 yeah, it's a little heavy and dense, but the concept is the leadership pipeline. I'm looking at the years of experience that you don't have, and the idea is that you make these turns in your career. The first one, obviously, is an individual contributor to a manager. 50% of people in management jobs are still acting as individual contributors. Mm-hmm. And so that's the first part of the turn, and then you become a manager of managers, and then you become a VP, and then you become a GM. And some of you will go on to be CEO. And each of those terms are important fits because you have to stop doing what you are doing well and start doing some new things that take a little bit of a black hole and you're not sure what you need to do. But you may look for this book, has that all mapped out for you. You know, like the